um, if we're going to talk seriously about engagement with the private sector and improving the lives of refugees through work in hosting areas or through the previous panel on skills matching and the like, we, we need to begin to understand these things. We need to have these conversations. And, and if, they're, if they seem uninteresting to you, we're going to have to tell you why it's interesting, in fact. Um, and we can't pretend that we don't get it. Um, anyway, well, now people are settled. Great. It's really my great uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Josh Bennett, who's the Executive Vice President of Show of Force. Show of Force um, is uh, an award-winning uh, media and production um, company, and they use storytelling to talk about really some of the world's most uh, pressing issues. Um, they created uh, multi-platform initiatives like Half the Sky, maybe you've seen that, that um, uh, turning oppression into opportunity for women worldwide and, and, and some high profile films and television series for uh, PBS, uh, CNN, HBO and others. Their, their most recent effort, and you'll see a short clip of this, is called Humanity on the Move and it, it, it seeks to use storytelling to help reframe the refugee issue and in that way is a nice segue into our final panel of the day. So uh, over to you, Josh. Thank you, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Alex said, Humanity on the Move is uh, an effort that came out. Um, for us, it's been an obsession over the last year. It started in a conference held by Refuge Point in Harvard. It was really the genesis of this idea of how can we use media and storytelling to shift perceptions on refugees, point towards innovative solutions, and bring together different players and actors to build a concentrated movement to really change how people see refugees and people forced to flee their homes. So um, we've had uh, months and months of filming, and all I can say is that I think it's imperative on us to really focus on how can we tell the story of our shared humanity? How can we show that people who are labeled refugees or IDPs or forced migrants share so much in common with us, our hopes, our dreams, everything about our better natures that I think is not getting out there and not being told. So I think it's a critical time to have this conversation and uh, I'm excited to show you this brief clip and I want to thank briefly the IKEA Foundation, the Landry Family Foundation, and the Perspective Fund who've been great partners and supporters and also organizations like Refuge Point, UNHCR and IOM and others who've been uh, great consultants on this project along the way and great supporters. And uh, we look forward to this conversation and talking about how we can partner more together and tell these stories. So without further ado, here's the uh, first clip of what will be many. And just so I, I'll say this is uh, the first of two films and we're just starting. There'll be a lot uh, a more short content. There'll be uh, short films with the New York Times. There'll be a lot of additional pieces coming out. So this is a beginning uh, and we look to be putting out a lot more later this year and into next year. So thank you. براميل تنزل العالم تموت الوضع كان كثير كثير سيء بسوريا الماراه استان غوبرناندو هندوراس دي تي امناسا اونا مارا نو تي بوديس اسكوندر ان ننغونا بارت نو سابس ان كي مينوتو باسا فالتار خمس سنين انا مهاجرة بيتي بحلب مالي مكان لا ارجع مثلا وات از هوم ذا هوم از سكاي اند جراوند وي دونت هاف هوم اما ما سنتيريا كومو كومو ان مي كاسا ان اوتر بايس بيرو تينيموس كي تراتار دي سوبيرارنو تراتار دي سوبريفيفير y secuestran y piden este dinero entonces si no lo dan pues los matan hasta que yo no saque a mi familia de allá no voy a estar tranquila que nadie sabe la vuelta del mundo que tal que me regrese para un día بأي لحظة ممكن تنمسك وممكن ترجع. Hello, Es como que cada paso que doy es como que estoy dejando un pedazo de mi corazón. هي النتيجة هي مغامرة. 
نقطة رجعة ما عاد فيه Si puedo que a pesar de todo lo que me ha pasado, si puedo echar para adelante, si puedo decir lo logré. We have one goal is to cross, to be together. Y pensar que ahí adentro ya es Estados Unidos. Now my great pleasure to introduce uh, the introducer, the moderator of the, our last session on changing the narrative. Uh, Jill Savitt is special advisor to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. She's a, a longtime human rights advocate who's focused on uh, public campaigning and strategic communications. She works with Human Rights First and Human Rights Watch and is a senior advisor, as I said, to the uh, Holocaust Museum and has curated um, at a human rights gallery at the New Museum on Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta. Jill, thanks for being here. Thanks, Alex. Um, and thanks, everyone, for making it this late in the day. This is the last strategic dialogue. And uh, in many ways, it's been previewed in all of the earlier sessions. There's been a thread, I think, all day long about how do you take the negative perceptions that are out there about refugees, about economic burden, about security threat. How do you push back on those, and how do you create a different kind of narrative? I mean, today's session couldn't be more timely when uh, I, I'm sure by now everyone has seen this Skittles meme that's out there. With um, for those who haven't, there's it, uh, the Trump, one of Trump's sons, uh, tweeted about it. There's a picture of a bowl of Skittles. And it says, um, if I have this bowl of Skittles and I tell you that three Skittles in this will kill you, would you take a handful? That's our Syrian refugee, that's, that's the Syrian refugee crisis for us. So there's a lot out there in the world to push back against for sure. And we have a terrific panel of communications experts who we're going to talk about this with. Um, they come from all, all different issues they've worked on, but including refugees. Um, I will introduce them. I'm going to run the panel a little bit differently and throw out a question, um, tap one person to take the lead on it, and then invite everyone else to jump in. I'm hoping for a conversation. If you disagree, please push back. Um, we want to make really concrete suggestions about how to change the narrative about refugees, the kind of tactical um, tools and approaches that we can use. So I'm just going to go down very quickly and say who's here. Um, we, this is Tim Dixon. He's the co-founder and managing director of Purpose Europe, which is based in London. He leads Purpose's global refugee and migration hub uh, that's focused on changing hearts and minds in Europe and globally about the refugee crisis. Then we have Laura Satrakian. She's the CEO, co-founder, and executive director of News Deeply, which is an independent digital media project that's led by journalists and technologists, and it explores new ways of storytelling about global crisis. She's also been a reporter in the Middle East. Um, then we have Mazen Hayek, who is the official spokesman and group director of for commercial PR and CSR for NBC Group, which is the largest media conglomerate in the Arab world. Then we have uh, Lisa Ross, She's managing director of APCO's uh, worldwide in Washington, in their Washington, D.C. office. APCO is a global communications consulting firm, and Lisa has decades of agency experience at other global firms and also served in the first and second terms of the Clinton administration. And then at the end, we have Frank Sherry. He's the founder and executive director of America's Voice, which focuses on using communications and media strategy on immigration and refugee issues, and he was the executive director of the National Immigration Forum for 17 years. So we're going to start off with um, just a couple slides and a brief film from Tim that will put us all on the same page in terms of what is the public perception out in the world about refugees. So what are we contending with? Tim. Winning the public narrative is critical. Uh, we know that governments around the world would be doing a whole lot more if they felt the public was on side. And that's why we need to understand where the public is at. Uh, there's been some great research in the last year, Pew Global, 
uh, the tent tracker research. Uh, the research has come out from IFOP in France, um, IRC recently, Brookings Institution, all doing cross-country comparisons. I'm distilling, I think, the four most important insights from that research. So the first of those, and this is super oversimplified, but essentially the public across the world in each country divides into four groups, one of which is hostile, around about a quarter on average, one of which is supportive, around about a quarter on average, and then a larger group of about half which are in the middle. And you can break that, that half in the middle, the sort of anxious middle as they're described, into one that's a little older and concerned more about cultural values and another, another that's a little younger and generally more concerned about economic issues. Now, as I say, huge oversimplification, but it holds fairly true. There's some countries, Germany, Sweden, Spain, Portugal, for example, where they have a larger supportive group, um, US, United Kingdom, uh, Netherlands uh, in the middle. Uh, and then there's groups like the Eastern European countries, uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech, Slovakia, uh, France, which have a larger um, hostile group. Um, second insight is there is a significant base of pro-refugee supporters that cares deeply and they want to do more. And as I say, roughly a quarter. Um, what's the characteristics of this group? They're younger, they're more educated, they live in big cities, global cities, they generally have higher incomes, and importantly, they are growing. So despite everything we're hearing, the negatives of the last year, it is important to know that the overall picture is that group is, is growing. However, they're not well organised. Um, they're not nearly as active as the populists who are mobilising, the far right, the extremists, um, and they don't know exactly what to do. So one in four say that they don't know what to do to help. But if they knew what to do, they'd actually do a lot. One in six say they'd actually welcome a refugee family into their own home, which is a, a reflection that they really get this as an important, it's an issue of the kind of world, and world they live in and country they live in. Third insight, this anxious middle group, they hold mixed views. Uh, so they both have compassion. They say, yes, we have a responsibility to take in refugees. They are, you know, essentially that 50% agree with that proposition. But they're also worried. They're worried about terrorism. They're worried about the economic pressures that come from um, uncontrolled refugee flows. Um, in, that works out in different ways in different countries. Um, and they're concerned, uh, particularly the older groups, about the loss of cultural values from people who may not assimilate well, integrate well into their community. Um, fourth insight, there is a way forward. There's a lot that we could be doing to shape public opinion that we're not doing now. Um, an important part of that is that to win this, just as we can learn from the, the other side, the populist far right that's become so much more organised in the last few years, we have to engage people through their values, through emotion and through their sense of identity, more than through facts and reason. This is fundamentally to win this debate, it's got to be about, about us, right, and who we are, not just about them, about the refugees themselves. We have to acknowledge that they have legitimate concerns about the orderliness and fairness of migration policy and refugee policy. They need reassurance. They're not confident that governments are going to solve this problem and, and governments are discredited and political leaders are discredited in carrying a positive message on refugees, so we need to find other spokespeople. And I think we need some fresh approaches. So a fresh approach that I think offers us some real potential um, is the private sponsorship um, uh, opportunity that we talked about earlier today. And what I wanted to do is to show you something, but just before sh show, showing that um, film, let me just say in, in sort of three phrases what I think the, the, the positive frame that you can win a strong majority in most countries with. That is, we have a responsibility to take in refugees, governments need to do more to help, and more needs to be done. Uh, and in most countries, there's overwhelming support for those propositions. Let me finally just show a sample of how we can message around the private sponsorship um, opportunity that we were discussing earlier today. And this is just 60 seconds um, from the, some filming we did in Canada last week. We might never have to hear another bomb again. We've had something to do with that. I think that's amazing. I have a little empty nest going on in my own house. So they really filled for me that niche of grandchildren that I don't yet have. I've always wanted kids, and uh, I've never had the opportunity. 
I'm already thinking I need a bigger car. Like, I need a, I need a minivan or something. It's, it's changed my life. It's great. Yeah. You will create friendships and watch a family grow. That is the best thing that I've ever done. I can't imagine doing anything that's more worthwhile. Great, now I'm gonna to get to see them grow up, you know, knowing that I was a big part of it. We have grandchildren and all of a sudden it's like we have three other little grandchildren. They decided to uproot their family and come over to a strange land, to strange people, and put their trust in us. So that's what has always been overwhelming, how much trust they put in us. Absolutely overwhelming. So we're super excited because we know that the story of a welcomer is easier for most people to relate to than the story of a refugee. And this piece of shifting the narrative away from governments are imposing refugees on an unwilling population to people are ready to welcome and want to be welcomers. And it's an incredible and wonderful experience to be a welcomer. I think there's some real opportunity to, to, to break down some barriers here. We saw the same thing when we came across the White Helmets, the Syrian rescue teams, a couple of years ago working on Syria, and have seen in the last two years how their story has engaged a much wider audience around that story. So that's where I see there is some really great potential um, around that as a very concrete initiative that we could be working together on in the next year. That's great, and I would um, urge our panelists to comment on that as well as, as we move forward. I wanna ask, um, and maybe we could start with Lisa on this and others feel free to join in. Do you think it's possible to do a global campaign? You know, it, or, or is the situation in each country sufficiently different that you can't do something global, you have to do it country by country depending on the situation in that country? With all due respect to everyone in the room, I don't see a lot of millennials, but uh, if we take the millennial mindset, the answer is yes. Anything is possible. Uh, <laughs> we fundamentally believe, I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of criticism about millennials. To me, they are the best generation, not just because I have two of them, but they believe any and everything is possible. And so I think when we take on that mindset that it's possible, if you look at the resources in this room, uh, the capital that's in this room, the passion that's in this room, it's, it's, it's impossible for us to not take on a global campaign and it's, it's, um, it's unacceptable for us to not take on a global campaign. I, I would like to talk about Tim's work. I feel like you've been following uh, my comments about this forever and I'm so happy to see it. The story has to be positive. I need and want to see what happens when you get here. Because then I believe it's possible. I believe that change is possible. And I think emphasizing these very positive stories about what can happen when resources are brought to bear, when people believe that something is possible, and you see those families, um, it mitigates and it eradicates many of the concerns that people have about crime. Uh, about um, uh, integration, whatever that means, uh, socialization, employment. But when you see a positive story, then not only do I believe it's possible, it makes me want to be a part of it. Absolutely. Yeah, do you want Absolutely, I was just gonna say, as I just barely make it as a millennial, <laughs> and um, so I always find it interesting, but in addition to some tears that come up when you watch something like that, there's also, are Canadians really that much nicer than us? <laughs> and I do think that in this generation, there's a sense of, wait, I want to get in on this, and yes. I, I want to one-up the good with some more good. That's real. It's not, it's not fiction, what I'm saying. People, right. people really want to be part of it. If you allow me, if, if I want to be practical, I would like to call upon everyone, for us in the media around the world, on World Refugee Day, to do a refugee thon, or let's call it a... A, a, a global campaign a la Ice Bucket Challenge. I mean, we've seen the Ice Bucket Challenge everywhere on social media, peer-to-peer, -peer, celebrities. It was the talk of the town in five continents. We haven't seen anything similar for refugees. So let's do our own Ice Bucket Challenge for refugees. Let's do our own global TV campaign, same day. I mean, as NBC, we're happy to let our 20 TV channels in the Middle East, leading channels, go be part of it. 
a global TV teleton or refugee thon, and obviously use the power of celebrities as refugee ambassadors. We've used it uh, recently by taking Arab celebrities to refugee homes and refugee camps, uh, and we add that, and it created in the Middle East a lot of sympathy and support, and people wanted to help, and the top celebrities who were reluctant in participating in the campaign would participate in it next year. So we took the second tier this time because we didn't pay them money, and now the first tier is excited to be part of it. So let's put our forces, we can do it. We can use the power of people, a la Ice Bucket, a la uh, ambassadors, to pull in some serious funds and serious efforts. You know, just to push back, on, just to mine that a little deeper. So if you give to a humanitarian organization, if you then go on Facebook, because they know everything about you, you see all these ads for humanitarian organizations, and a lot of those ads focus on the dire need. Give to, for food, for medical supplies, and that image is very different from the one, Tim, you're talking about. You do want to make people know what people are fleeing and the dire situation that's there. Are these two images in conflict with each other? Can you do both? You can do more. I think part of what Purpose has done that's so brilliant with the White Helmets campaign is find the heroes. And you know, just by way of context, we have launched a platform called Refugees Deeply that's been looking at the crisis in Syria deeply. Purpose has been a great partner in that um, for four years. And we've seen what people respond to every day. They respond to the stories of heroism, but they also can find axes of relatability that are very potent. The most popular pieces we have run have been on child prostitution in Athens, but not simply because it was a salacious headline, but because we spoke to kids in their teenage years who said, I never thought I'd be doing this. I'm stuck. Pregnant refugees walking from Greece to Germany, a pregnant refugee living at one of the Berlin airports. It, and it's not because Afghan refugees in Sweden who face deportation, Oromo refugees from Ethiopia in Egypt setting themselves on fire out of desperation. And these were our top stories. And it's because they were extremely relatable. Yes, there was a sense of crisis and desperation. There was also a sense of agency. And beyond that, these stories that we've highlighted in the past, there are a lot of the people helping, stories of the, the translators without borders. So some of it has been the response community stepping up as storytellers to share how they're helping. Mm -hmm. And that notion of the people who are working the problem, very, very potent. Just to jump in here, um, I think sometimes we get into a sort of an either or argument about how to approach communications when it comes to battling xenophobia and anti-refugee attitudes. I mean, Tim's uh, public opinion research, which is how my life has been defined in the last 30 years in America, trying to figure out how we communicate about these issues to those different audiences. And what we finally figured out is that you know, we need a strategy that communicates to the people who are on board and deeply compassionate and want to act. And we need a slightly different, overlapping, but different set of arguments that connect with those people that are ambivalent and in the middle. And we need a strategy for dealing with the hardcore opposition that tries to marginalize them rather than empower them. And and, and it's hard because we sometimes, I mean, I worked on, I work on immigration issues as much as refugee asylum issues. We've had civil wars within our movement between the base that wants to go hard on justice and the, the folks who want to be pragmatic and appeal to the middle. And we finally figured out that we need to do both and that we're on the same team in different lanes. Now, not everybody has to be in the, all the lanes. Right. Right. You can have the anti-hate people going after the bigots and the xenophobes. You can have the pragmatic people talking about success and solutions and controls and competence and management and economic benefits, et cetera. And you can have the base talking about solidarity and compassion and justice. Those are not inconsistent. What, what we sometimes think is that, well, if we have one message or one tactic or one campaign, it's going to add up to a wind tunnel of of, of narrative, and it doesn't. What we need is a narrative that actually you put legs under all three of those lanes, then you're starting to get serious. Starting to get serious. And even then, I mean, let's face it, we're up against populist, uh, a populist opposition that is getting stronger. Uh, 
and, and, and unless we can figure out how to have the energy that, com that can combat that, that energy on, on the populist, xenophobic right, um, with our base, it's going to be hard to win, but we have to win the middle too. And so that's where I think a, a both-and approach is what we need if we're going to understand how to proceed. And it's important to note, I mean, Frank has been doing this work, as I say, 20 or 30 years, building, making the sector in the United States smart and strategic and doing the incredibly hard work of aligning people around how to get there. The, the, the European societies we're working in are where, you know, the America, America was 20 years ago. So in France, for example, you can't have a sensible debate around refugees because because of how migration is, is viewed and the intensity of opposition to migration means that there isn't a conversation about refugees that you can have you know, without all of, all of that being contaminated. So I think that sort of piece of saying, this is hard work, it requires uh, a degree of intensity around both the research, the evidence base, um, and, the, and the strategy and getting people alignment, and time. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I'm optimistic that there's a lot that can be down, done. I'd also say this is like a 10-year project and more um, because the, the debate also needs to be won in every individual country and cultural context. And the debate in Germany and Sweden and Britain and the Netherlands and France, et cetera, are all different debates. Simply within the US debate and consistent with everything Frank has shared, the Skittles moments are golden opportunities we see a core group of, I suppose, the, the supportives on our site every day. The undecideds come around once in a while, and whenever there's a question like, what is Aleppo, or a Skittles moment, everyone's ears are open because the sheer absurdity of it makes everyone curious, and we should mind those. Right, but we should, but we're really not organized to do that right now. There is no designated rapid response SWAT team on message that is looking at What's coming out that's negative, like a campaign has. If you have a political campaign, there's someone doing that kind of research and is ready to go. Is What advice would you have for the community about how to organize itself to have that? To organize itself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I have, uh, like many of you, for the past few days, I've done CGI. I've done the uh, Social Good Summit. I'm doing this now. No one is organizing. No one is communicating. No one is coordinating. And so we are all, it's this, you all have seen me for the past three days. I've seen you. Uh, and then after we leave these sessions, there isn't one entity that is taking the nuggets from each one of these conversations and saying, let's organize. We spend so much time talking about how what is something impossible. Uh, can we not do it? It's, it's literally... It takes someone, all of you, all of us in this room, to simply take all this information, aggregate it, and get it out. While I have this, I do want to make this one point, and not that anyone on the panel has done this. We also have to let people be who they are. Some people are legitimately afraid. Some people legitimately don't understand. Some people just don't get it, and we cannot call them nativists. We can't call them homophobes. We can't call them racist. We can't call them sexist. We just have to let them be who they are because that same empathy has to be on this end, and we do ourselves a disservice when we put people in these boxes, mm -hmm. um, and when you're in a box, you can't have a conversation because you're in that box, but if we allow people to feel what they feel and accept that we have an opinion too, then you can get to a much further, much vibrous, much more coordinated conversation. That's great. What, what I want to do is we have unbelievable communications experts also around the table, and so I want to bring in some other voices. If anyone wants to sh reflect on what's been said, add to it, we'll come back to the panel in a second, but just do your, table, your uh, name tent like this. Okay, uh, why don't we just start going out there. The light is really bright. We'll start here and we'll just go around. Oh, I just wanted to, it's Jack Leslie. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the point that Lisa made about millennials. I'm a few years away, uh, <laughs> Sarah, but I also am parent to a couple of them. And I, I think the, and it also goes to the question of who's responsible for the message and who's responsible for a campaign. 
We all, especially those of us who have millennials, know that the most important thing to them is authenticity. Um, and um, uh, I think, you know, that the most effective campaigns for millennials are going to be those that are conceived and produced by millennials. If you look right now at, I think, one of the highest rated uh, documentaries on Netflix, short documentaries, it's, it's something called Salam Neighbor. Josh, I don't know whether you're, whether you're familiar with it, but Salam Neighbor was a, is an hour-long documentary produced by two uh, young uh, guys out of Claremont McKenna who went and lived in the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan and have produced a really moving piece. And I think, you know, to the extent, but one of the things I think it's reflected really well, Josh, in your work, but it's giving refugees voices themselves and trying to create an opportunity for kind of organic, if you will, uh, communications really to come from the communities both those affected like refugees and millennials who are going to themselves make more of a difference than a big PR firm coming up with a with a refugee campaign, even though we do have all the research in the world. With no offense we, to big PR firms. <laughs> <laughs> with none, none at all. But, uh, so right. thank you for that. I think it's what we need to remember, what I've heard so far is that there's a both and or many and. It's not just refugee voices. It's also the kind-hearted people who take some risk or sacrifice to help them. It's the community that they come into that, as Frank was saying, deciding on any one thing to do is where we sometimes get hung up. So I'm, I'm just going to keep going around. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I did field work in seven conflict zones over the past five years for a book that just came out. And I want to just highlight that the same concerns about fear of people taking jobs and fear of security threats that people are concerned about in the United States and Europe uh, people in the host countries are feeling as well, so on the Thai-Burma border, on the Kenyan border. And so I think there's some nice connections between the, um, the panel we just had before this and now. Um, I'm, I've started uh, the Alight Fund with my co-founder. We're going to be investing in refugee and host community entrepreneurs. But I think there's an opportunity for creative uh, private sector investment to create these positive stories so that those positive stories can be told and to create opportunities for host communities and refugees to be working together and, see, and, and really seeing each other as, as common humans and, and not as a threat. So just want to remind us that it's not just a concern in the global north. Hi, I'm Regina Catrambone, and uh, I am the co-founder of uh, MOAS, a migrant offshore aid station. So MOAS uh, comes from, from the private sector, start uh, as a, is an NGO, but start uh, as a startup. My husband and I uh, put the funds because, uh, as Lisa say, we believe in our dreams. And uh, um, from 2014, we are out at sea with uh, two boats now, drones, uh, uh, equipped for search and rescue with two cameras. And we create also Migrant Report, uh, that uh, is the sister of a Migrant Offshore Aid Station that uh, give uh, to the refugee a voice. So we stop with them, uh, we ask them their opinion, why they are fleeing this conflict, why they are putting their families uh, in this uh, all the boat and this uh, inflatable boat that uh, are uh, extremely fragile out at sea. Myself, uh, uh, our daughter that is the new millennial, she's just 19, 20 now, and uh, my husband, all our family was out at sea. So we left our business uh, in the hands of other people and uh, we proved the concept that can be done. So from 2014, uh, until today, so three migratory season, we rescue over 27,000 people from the Mediterranean. <laughs> Thank you, and from the Aegean. We also went in Asia, where we're trying to understand the Rohingya uh, situation. So I think uh, that uh, it's true, if you can dream, you can do. And. Uh, Today, here, I see so much potential. Now, we are also going back to what Lisa was saying, organizing. Organizing is a difficult thing, but uh, can be done. Now, we or are organizing humanitarian flights. Because, uh, yes, it's true that we talk about Syria, but sometimes, uh, uh, maybe because I'm from South Italy, but we forget about Libya. In Libya, there are many people uh, there is a war over there, 
And nowadays, uh, uh, now we are talking here, and my men are out at sea with these uh, people that are uh, buying this uh, eight meter speedboat and uh, put to their mother, their father, their children. Nowadays you can see wheelchair. You can see very sick people out at sea. So this is a, a reality check that uh, civil society need to understand. And uh, now is not the moment uh, to lift our shoulder and say that the government uh, need to take care. I think uh, that uh, where the government stop, civil society need to come and fulfill the gap because uh, we have no time uh, to lose. It, each moment is paid by the death or drowning of these people. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Mazen. Jill, in, in practical terms, uh, some of us have attended the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul uh, back in June or July this year. There was a, co I mean, a coalition, there's a big effort. UNHCR is doing a great job. So maybe, because to respond to the valid point that Lisa mentioned about organization and about putting together the forces of government, of civil society, of private sector, of, of fundraisers, etc. Maybe, we, I mean, the, the World Humanitarian Summit had everyone in one room for two days. Everyone, heads of states, heads of government, uh, heads of companies working on education, on uh, human relief, etc. So that with the UNHCR, maybe there could be merit in, in appointing a general secretariat that would have a comms leg, that would have a development leg, that would have an organizational leg, and pull in some funds and work in one direction approved by private sector and governments. Just if I can add that uh, we need to speed the process because uh, until last year we talked about the resettlement and relocation. However, these two uh, situations are quite uh, slow. I mean, uh, uh, I'm Italian, but I live in Malta, and in Malta only 27 people, I think, uh, com came from the relocation. So uh, we need to understand also, uh, in the other panel there were the two guys that uh, arranged this new concept of uh, uh, matching uh, uh, <laughs> the migrants' need. Yes, that is fine. But uh, what uh, Lauer was saying before, that unfortunately this uh, doesn't match uh, what uh, the politician uh, have in mind, because mm. we need to understand uh, also how many countries are ready to take the people and uh, see them uh, as uh, an opportunity, not as a problem. Yeah. This is what I want. Yeah, thank you. Hello, I'm Hannah Dalmet with Concordia, and as you may know, we are a largely millennial group, mm -hmm. driven and proud of that, uh, but lots of energy and excited to help with this convening and organization. I have um, an anecdote that I'm trying to present as a suggestion here, and while I'm not a brilliant creative type, as you listed to the room, uh, I am the family of refugees. Not directly, but my grandparents came over to the United States immediately following World War II for several years before returning back. And that experience as refugees uh, deeply shaped them. And as such, in Germany, they're part of the welcoming group. And they have adopted uh, a Syrian family. And they have you know, shared with all of us their experiences with this family and how eye-opening and wonderful it's been. And I suggest this because I love deeply. I, I mean, I think it's a fantastic Forum, and Thank I you. think it, <laughs> big fan. Um, and I think what would be neat would be a segment that compares these cross-generational welcomers, because part of what people fear is the unknown, right? And so if we can show these amazing positive examples of refugees throughout all of our generations, uh, and, and take away some of that fear, and do it through film, through storytelling, I think that that could be a very powerful segment. So. We do talk to ourselves a lot. We, we spend a lot of time talking to a community who largely agrees with us, and we are not breaking out necessarily into different communities where they, there is opposition and there are legitimate concerns that people have about their security, about their own economic situation, about the role of government. How do we break out, and you all are part of the media who you try and reach new audiences, how do we reach this unconverted, this whole group of people that we're not currently reaching? I, I think in one way, 
similarly, you, you go to where they are. You go to um, what moves them. You find commonality in a purpose. You find commonality in a shared passion. And then once you bring people together, you have that conversation. Um, the Jesuit Refugee Services is putting together a extraordinary concert tour with Emmy Lou Harris and others. And there will be people who come from all over the country in these 14 cities, many of whom the only thing they have in common is a love for Emmy Lou Harris. Uh, and her music, as you know, is from here to here. But the idea is for JRS to bring them together for this and then have a conversation about something else. Because it's, you know, with any difficult topic, let's find what we agree to first and then find a way to have that more difficult conversation. Yeah, Frank? Sure. Um, Look, when we were getting our ass kicked, that's a technical term, uh, in the United States on refugees and immigrants in the mid-90s, we didn't know what to do. Uh, thankfully, some friendly funders went along with our suggestion that maybe we should test public opinion. And maybe we should have a better idea of where people are and what they respond to. I have to say, the first couple of focus groups I ever saw, I was blown away. All these people in the middle weren't talking about race and culture. They were talking about government ineptitude and why is it out of control and is it going to work and my community's changing and I'm, I just have questions about it. And I thought, wow, that's a lot more legitimate than I thought it was. I was trying to dismiss any opposition as mm -hmm somehow bigoted and racist, when in fact, there are bigots and racists. We should call them out. Um, and uh, they speak for a quarter or a third of the population, depending on your country. But there is a huge opportunity to cleave off the bigots and the racists and who they speak to and the people in the middle. I'll tell you, a lot of it has to do with being pragmatic. I mean, this is, uh, I have a lot of uh, arrows I'm still picking out of my back because uh, I was one of those who said, look, if we keep saying we're for open borders, we're ceding the middle to the people who are arguing we're the only answer when it comes to controls. When we adopted a position of, wait a minute, we can be humane, we can grow uh, the response to refugees and immigrants, and do so in an orderly fashion, all of a sudden our poll findings went into majority. So the big issue in the states on immigration is what do you do about 11 million undocumented immigrants? If we said legalize them and who cares if another 11 million come in, we wouldn't get out of our corner. But we say let's deal humanely with 11 million and let's come up with a combination of legal immigration and enforcement measures that can modernize the system that makes it safe, legal, orderly, and more pro-immigrant. And that combination puts us in the 75 to 85 percent range and marginalizes our opponents. So I do think that part of our challenge is to figure out from a policy perspective how to make sure we're speaking to the middle. But it's, so that's important. But we still, I think, my view on the refugee work in the United States and in Europe, to the extent that I'm familiar with it, is that we're not organized. We don't have the people who are, who are doing the research. Thankfully, Tim's doing it now in Europe. There's not the research, there's not the rapid response, there's not the, there's individual campaigns that are brilliant, but there's not yet a coherent kind of uh, either global campaign or movement-oriented approach that I think is absolutely necessary to put legs under a narrative. Just, oh, yeah, uh, just specifically on the, on the research, so the kind of research that we really need is the, the segmentation research that breaks down populations and that gives you the deeper, like a composite picture of who is in each of those groups. Um, and so we've just commissioned that in France and Germany with um, Ipsos um, and hoping to add more countries to that list. Um, it takes several months. It's a much more expensive form of research, but it will give strategic focus to the uh, civil society and to political actors as well who are working. And then that then is the basis for doing the really practical things. And, and just to sort of jump to a, you know, a super practical end, the medium we should now be in, as an example right now, is the autoplay no sound videos that sit on Facebook, right, which have now become this 
hugely popular and effective way of reaching people. Um, and you know, I would be you know with the with the, the the text over the screen. You don't actually see what you don't hear what's going on. Now that is like the the medium. We did something on the white helmets a, a few weeks ago that reached 23 million people. Um, you know, with a story about Syrian heroes that we could never get, you know, barely get media to cover a couple of years ago. So there are some really practical things about the platforms where we can reach people. And if I may, uh, Tim, it's not only about reaching, it's about impact and engagement. Let me give you the example of the Middle East. Uh, 68 years of Israeli-Arab conflict, there's a huge fatigue of bad news because 90% of news is bad news for 65 years. So you put a small kid cut in pieces on a beach, no one cares. You get the reach, you show it. it people look at it, but there's no engagement. There's no reaction. So also we need the kind of interruptive campaigns that go beyond making the, the content reach the people. And that's another challenge. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. I'd love the idea, and I'd love to take it up after the session. <laughs> Two things that I've seen really work that seem to be deeply necessary, no pun intended. This is the age of the explainer, and people are thirsty, and they do very well. These are complex issues that need to be broken down, and I think that's something that a lot of the NGOs and communicators in this room can come together and do very, very well. Um, and the other is that we have found, and I, I very much admire the migrant report. I think they've done a great job with this as well in the explaining. Um, and also, it, you know, true fact, I was a correspondent for ABC News. When it's easier to put the pieces together, they are more likely to get on air. So we have consciously cultivated a lot of relationships with the mainstream press, whereby we deliver the stories and then co-produce the videos for various stations, NPR and others. Um, and what we found is that there isn't enough of that. I think a lot of the media are waiting for us to show up with the pieces. For better or worse, it's harder for them than ever to do the work themselves, to be in these places. And we have found that wonderful NGOs we work with, from Human Rights Watch to Mercy Corps and beyond, are more actively reporting and corresponding from the field than any other, well, than any news agencies, and they're functionally becoming publishers. So I really encourage that. And when it's done with authenticity and more honest, intellectual honesty than advocacy, at least in that genre, it really does an incredible job of sharing the realities and the human stories on the ground. Great, we, we've had excellent advocacy from the audience who would like to be included in the questions, which I will, but I'm gonna go around the table first. So I think Ari is next. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, we stood up about a year and a half ago something called Project High with USA for You and HCR with, with the help of Alex uh, when he was there as a DHC. So what, what the Hive does, and, it, and there's a good reason maybe some of you have not necessarily heard about it, because the idea is it's an impact and engagement lab for audiences that don't need to hear this story. Um, so the, the first thing that we did was we hired a bunch of the folks that worked on the Obama campaign to do an entire micro-targeting analysis of the entire U.S. adult population. So we now have a model with over 200 million Americans in it that tells us exactly where they stand on the refugee issue. But not only where they stand, but what message would resonate with them. From there, what we've done is we've developed a series of micro-targeted campaigns. So they're not, well, I do believe, and my background is in kind of larger meta campaigns, a lot of what we've done has gone under the radar unless you're actually part of those specific groups. So two quick examples. One, we did Rainbow Refugees, which is for LGBTI, specifically coming up through Central and South America. And the second was something called Under His Wings, which we caught a little bit of flack for, but was messaging to Christian conservatives. And a lot of the messaging that was in there was the kind of messaging that you probably wouldn't hear through normal either UN or typical NGO channels, but it, it resonated deeply with, with these groups. Um, part of also how we're doing this is everything that we do is through an agile MVP model. So we don't take a lot of time to do it. We have our own digital team. Almost everyone who works at the Hive, which is only a few blocks away, is probably in their mid-20s. So we can go from idea to campaign in seven days. Um, and with our micro-targeting model, when we go out to connect with people on Facebook or even in their home or wherever they are, we're able to actually connect directly with the individuals that we want to target as opposed to actually trying to get people through a, a broad swath. So the, the, the URL there is projecthive.us. And you can see me after if you're at all interested um, in participating. What, because a lot of what we've done is work with a lot of actually the, the groups in this room to launch, again, these kind of sub-campaigns that are meant to engage 
and that lead to impact that we eventually kind of ladder them up to something bigger. So if this sounds familiar, it is because most of us come from presidential campaign politics. So for us, we're not looking necessarily at our core audience, our probably four to five million core adults, a uh, million in the US, we're looking at kind of persuadables or people that if you meet them where they are, they will come along as opposed to you trying to say, well, this is a message and you should care about it. Again, it's, it's where they are, what's important to them, and from there we move into a, a deeper engagement pattern with them to, to work on the issue. Great, thanks, Ari. I just want to be mindful of comments. Try and summarize them if you can, because we have folks in the audience too who want to speak. Mike, did you, no? If I can, just um, a couple of thoughts. <clears throat> One is that I think it's useful to look. I started working in the refugee world uh, in the 70, 1970s, really, and we were still at a point coming out of a point where refugees were politically a completely bipartisan consensus issue. They were tied to our politics. Um, we took Hungarians. We took Soviet Jews. We took Cubans. We took Vietnamese. Those were populations that were fleeing our enemy. And so we had as many Republicans as Democrats who were refugee advocates, maybe more. Those are communities, it strikes me. I don't know how many people in this room are from the Cuban community or from the uh, Vietnamese community. But those are success stories that resonate across the spectrum. And so part of, I think, what we ought to be thinking about is how do we, we're not gonna regain that past. We're not gonna recreate the Cold War but we ought to be aware that there was this consensus and there are lots of people still who hearken back to Captive Nations Day at the UN, at the US Congress, things like that. And those communities could be enormously helpful in broadening the message. Now a less positive thought. Jill, you said something at the beginning about the Skittles. <clears throat> I think we have a challenge today, not only because the politics are different, but because we have incident after incident where people are doing terrible things and they're linked to refugee policy. We had an incident Saturday where a Somali refugee asylum seeker stabbed 10 people. We had an incident here, 29 people went to the hospital, an Afghan asylum seeker. The right, that 25% Tim that you're talking about, are full blaze saying, Every refugee is implicated in this, and that's the Skittles. We don't have the response to that, and I think if we don't tackle that in your ambivalent and culturally concerned categories, um, we've got half the population that's hanging in the middle here, and they keep getting this bombardment of images of violence in our own society uh, perpetuated by people that are coming here to do no good. Yeah, I don't mean to be a downer. No, but no, th I think we got to do. I think it's an important part of how we mobilize. And I, I will after we go to the audience, finish the table, and go to the audience. I'm going to do a lightning round of the best investments we can make for doing global campaigning on refugees. I'll ask that of the panel when at the very end, but just to give you a heads up that that's coming your way, um, Josh. Jill, if you oh, if you don't mind, um, if we do anything well, we will come up with a response to that concern because it comes up over and over and over again. Um, a response, it's not the right one, but a response is when Timothy McVeigh blows up a building, we don't say that all white men are terrorists. Uh, we have to have the same, we don't, we simply don't. We don't start walking down the street and looking at people and saying, I'm worried about you. There is a different standard that we hold refugee and immigrant communities and other communities to that we simply don't hold others to. We're not going to change that, um, but that is the reality of it. Mm -hmm. I just want to add to Mike's point. Uh, you know, I come from a television background, but you know, over the last five years, all the projects I've done have had this deep engagement element where we focus on solutions, we focus on takeaways. Two pieces of research that I think are interesting quickly. Um, one in three actions you do online is a value statement. It's a value declaration that you're making publicly to your friends, your followers, your community that you've built online. The other thing is 40% of people, according to the same tent report that Tim was referencing, 40% of people want to help refugees, but they don't know what to do. And it's incumbent on us to come back with specific takeaways. That's the reason the Ice Bucket Challenge was so successful. You know, 
dump a bucket of ice over your head or give $100 to charity. It's pretty clear and it's pretty easy for people to say, okay, I can contribute and be a part of that. On the right, it's easy to say, I want to go build a big wall. That's very tangible. That's very clear so people can go and say, yup, let's build that wall or yup, let's kick them all out. The messaging is clear. The takeaway is clear. On our end, we have to have that same clarity of messaging. We have to tell people, this is what we need to do, and this is what you can do. It can be a small thing. It can be inviting somebody into your home. It can be a community-focused thing. It can be a small donation. It can start with a petition. But what those clear takeaways are and that clear messaging about what we stand for has to come through, and all of us need to work together, I think, to make that clarion call really clear. Thank you. I, I think uh, organizing our community around message might come up when we do our lightning round about global campaigning. We're going to go to the audience, mindful of the fact that we have five minutes left on this panel, so please summarize your um, question or comment. Um, my name is Art DeFair from uh, Canada. I'm a business person, but I spend most of my time on humanitarian immigrant things the last 40, 45 years. I, I want to make, there was a reference a couple of hours earlier to the private uh, sponsorship. I want to put that a bit into context. And I, I happen to think that Americans and Canadians are fundamentally not that different. We're both immigrant societies. But I think when you study that, I think study it carefully because there are some reasons why, why it has worked and otherwise. First of all, we believe in diversity, which means that you also import diversity. We have brought in people from 100 different countries. When you bring in from one or two, you create the other. So diversity has to be part of an immigration program. We do it little quietly, but we do it deliberately. Uh, the other part is that you want people to engage. You often hear, never become citizens here. Canada, these are rough statistics. Canada, of all foreign-born, we're 19% foreign-born. 80% are citizens. The US equivalent is 40%. The European is 20%. Engagement means also to take ownership. So I simply, I could mention more than that, but the private sponsorship program has, uh, we also have the members mentioned about the Vietnamese. The reason is Syrian work, because we have that tremendously positive memory of the Vietnamese and we built on that. So I would encourage the, I'm speaking here to the US because mainly that's what's here, not the European audience. But I'd encourage you to look at it, but look at it and adjust to your own society. But the engagement has been terrific and that's given the government all kinds of cover. And that's the important part of it as much as the money. The money isn't important. Thank you. Rabin Pasha, I am myself an Iraqi Kurdish refugee who came here in the 90s uh, escaping from uh, Saddam's regime. And um, I owe the uh, privilege of realizing my own American dream to being a refugee and coming here to the United States. And. Um, I just got back from our bill where we kicked off Iraqi Kurdistan's first entrepreneurship incubator, which probably most of you have not heard of or didn't know it even existed. Um, and it's taken a lot of work for it to get there. But we had our first class of 165 young entrepreneurs. And um, this was something that, and I, you know, we could talk more about that, I recognize in, in the sake of time, that not only created, and it's called My E-Dream, which stands for My Entrepreneurial Dream, and it does not only just create opportunities for these young people and these displaced populations, IDPs and refugees, to start their own companies and dreams, but it also provides a hugely amplifying message of hope and dreaming and rebuilding society from the ground up, especially investing in young people. And I brought that up for two reasons. Uh, one, I know we're talking about the refugee global agenda and how we can present the success stories. And I think refugee diaspora going back and helping to rebuild their countries is one of them. But the other side of it is also some of the success and amazing uh, work that is being done in these IDP communities, by these host communities as well. And in some of these conditions that we could provide them hope and something else that would prevent them from potentially becoming refugees and adding to the, to the problem that we are facing and the challenges we're facing. Second side of it is the positive stories uh, that I've heard so many uh, of you uh, looking for and uh, talking about, and I applaud that. Um, and I believe that we have plenty of it on the ground. A, a lot of it, uh, local people, not big organizations uh, with headquarters elsewhere. Uh, sometimes these local organizations who don't even have the time to write about it. And we really desperately need your help to push the ecosystem, to get this message out, and to be able to sustainably 
take this um, and scale it to the next level and reach the rest of those people who desperately need our help. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, yes, thanks. Um, I'm going to have to just arbitrarily cut off the questions from the audience. We're going to go to one here and then our lightning round, and then I'm sorry we have to close. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I will try to be very brief, but being from a kind of Syrian refugee, I have a French passport, but I come back to France after what happened to Syria. So I just want to mention some point. I'm very grateful for all what has been said, uh, but my question will be more about, for example, the ethic of media, how much we have to work on the ethic of media. Uh, the day after the, what happened in Paris, uh, my contract for a new rent has been deleted because I have a Syrian passport. Uh, even though the Syrian passport who have been found on the Paris attack has seemed to be fact, but the media didn't come back on the, on the story. So we have to work on the ethic of yeah. the uh, uh, media, especially mass I'm, media. I'm sorry, I'm going to need to let you just make that one point. Okay. We are, our clock is winding down. Just speed round here. The one thing that you would say with the public, the private sector, governments, others in the room could invest in for changing the narrative, what would it be? Tim. Uh, rapid response capacity so that in these big moments when the world is paying attention after terrorist attacks, for example, there is a humanizing message that avoids the, uh, particularly the Islamophobic messages that we're getting. Excellent. Explainers and nuance, stories that make it clear in Syria, for example, people are fleeing ISIS, our sworn enemy. Right. Refugee ambassadors, heroes of refugees, telling the stories of successes of global designers who, who were refugees, like Rabin, an entrepreneur who was refugees. Leverage the resources in this room, if not on this panel, and come back a year from now and report an action out. Frank, close us out. Uh, recognize that this battle is not going away, that it's likely that the battle between uh, xenophobic populism and uh, inclusive cosmopolitanism may be the dividing line in our uh, future, and we are not organized to fight it, and our opponents are. Finish out your comments. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry to have done just, that yeah, there. Uh, my last, very, very last comment will be on the, what I called, maybe it's not the right word, the charity approach, even in the UNHCR. I'm working with refugee women in Lebanon. I'm learning from them every day. They are amazing. I have a millions of photos of my iPhone. No one uh, look like what we have on the UNHCR photos. So. They are normal people. When we are talking about heroes, we have to think about the normality of heroes also. They are facing the everyday life with such a courage, but they are normal. They are teachers, they are, yeah. As a, so I just want to mention that we have to think about it. We, can, we could provide a lot of other photo that have been circulated. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, so glad you got to get that in. I want to thank our panel. Excellent, thank you so much for that uh, wisdom on communications, and thanks Concordia for holding this. Back to you. Thanks, Jill. I'm sorry we rushed you so much. I mean, obviously, this is of great interest, and we could do a lot more, and we will do a lot more, won't we? I think if you want to. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, Nick, did you want to say something? Yeah, we just to move you. Just very briefly. Um, just wanted to thank everyone for, for being here today. Um, you know, at Concordia, we, we don't view this as, as, as the end of our discussions here. We view it as the start, and, and also the start of hopeful action that comes out of this meeting. Um, and we will be hoping to play the role that you described um, in, uh, in the future on this issue. And, and uh, so the work starts tomorrow on that. Um, if everyone uh, who's, who's available and interested could make their way upstairs to the ballroom level, uh, we have the call to action um, that will take place around 545. Uh, and, then, and then the summit will wrap up for the day around 6. So on behalf of all of us at Concordia, thank you. and. Um, have a pleasant evening. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Jill.